Welcome friends! In this tutorial, I'll show you the power of using multi-meshes in Godot. So let's get to it. Back in the day, I got really into Skyrim mods, but the one thing that frustrated me was how quickly adding tons of grass ate into my frame rate. And so, my dream of covering the land of Skyrim in dense vegetation was limited only by my need to maintain a solid 60 frames per second. At the time, I didn't understand why it was so costly to render something that I thought was so simple. But let me take you behind the scenes to show you what the problem is, and why using multi-meshes in Godot can help you when you need to render a million things to the screen. Most modern computers are really two computers that work together, a CPU and a GPU. The CPU runs all your programs and is capable of a wide variety of complex calculations. However, it can only do one calculation at a time. When it's working on a problem, everything else needs to wait its turn. And like any other computer program, your video game's logic runs on the CPU. If your game has 1 million objects to render to the scene, the CPU needs to update and ask the GPU to render each individual object. It needs to do this 60 times per second, and if it can't get through all million objects in a 60th of a second, the frame rate drops. Compared to the CPU, the GPU is more limited and specialized to doing linear algebra. It's very good at doing vector math and matrix multiplication. In other words, it loves to push dots around 3D spaces. And because its set of calculations are so specialized, it can churn through millions of them at the same time. Therefore, the solution to render millions of objects to your computer screen is to try to push as much of the work onto the GPU as possible and not pester the CPU while it runs the game logic. In Godot, we can do this using multi-meshes. To set up a multi-mesh, we need to give it some information. First, we need to give it the mesh of the object that we want to make ridiculous numbers of in our game world. Second, we need to tell it exactly how many of those objects we're going to need. Finally, we need to tell the multi-mesh what kind of data needs to be stored for each instance of our object. Generally, a Godot's multi-mesh lets you store a color, position, and has some room for your own custom data. But you're not limited to using these data slots for what they're intended for. For example, you could use the color data to store how much an instance of an object is allowed to bend in the wind. Using the information we give it, the multi-mesh will make a huge list containing all the data for each of our objects, and it will push that data over to the GPU. Now when we run our game, the work of the CPU is greatly reduced. All it has to do is send one command per frame to the GPU telling it to render everything in that list, and the GPU will eat through it like it's nothing. Now ideally, multi-mesh objects should be things that don't move too much in our game world, like grass and trees. But sometimes you'll need to update the data in the big list. However, every time you do, keep in mind that you'll be using the CPU. Updating a few objects every once in a while is okay, but updating every object in the list every frame will leave you back on square one and with the game running at two frames per second. If you do need to update every object every frame, you should probably use a shader program to do it. Shaders are little programs that can run on the GPU. Millions of them can run at the same time without bothering the CPU. Using shaders, you can make grass blow in the wind, or how to animate or move thousands of fish swimming in a school all at the same time without starting your CPU on fire. Writing shader programs is beyond the scope of today's tutorial, but in today's demo project, I'll show you what a shader can do in combination with a multi-mesh. But first, I'll show you how to set up a basic multi-mesh, so it's time to hop into Godot. To start, I've set up a new scene with a spatial root node and a camera. To the root node, I'll add a multi-mesh instance node. Click on the multi-mesh node and head into the inspector to find the multi-mesh property. There, create a new multi-mesh resource and click on it to expand its properties. This list of properties is where we can give the multi-mesh the information it needs to run. The first three options determines the type of data that will be associated with each object instance. In the color data, we can choose from byte or float format. Byte format is more efficient but less precise, while float format is more precise but less efficient. We don't need this data slot, so I'll keep the default none option. The transform format holds the position data for each object. Our project is 3D, so I'll change the format to the 3D option. Like the color data, we don't need any custom data for this project, so I'll keep the custom data format at none. The instance count property is where we tell the multi-mesh how many objects we'll be using. For this tutorial, we won't go overboard. We'll stick to a conservative 400 objects. 
The visible instance count gives you the option to limit the number of objects that actually get rendered from the list, starting from the object with an instance ID of 0. A value of negative 1 displays all objects. The last bit of data the multi-mesh needs is the mesh of the object we'll be instancing 400 times. As usual for our tutorials, I'll drag in a test sphere. We can also give our object a material that will be used on every object instance. Find the material override property. I have our standard unshaded sphere with the black outline material already prepared. Visit my previous tutorials to learn how to set up this material. With that, our settings are complete. However, currently we have a list of 400 objects, each with a data slot for a position, but when we run our game, the position for each object is the same. Before the game starts, we need to initialize the position of each object. To do this, we'll need a script. In the script's ready function, I'll use nested for loops to set the x and z coordinates for each sphere. The multi-mesh resource has setter and getter functions for each of the three data types that can be included with each object instance. We need to set the position data so we can use the set instance transform function. This function requires an int value representing the unique instance ID for each object. We can use the x and z values from our for loops to calculate each of the 400 instance ID. This function also needs a transform. A transform can be created with a basis and a 3D vector to represent the object's origin. Because a newly created basis is an identity matrix by default, the origin vector will be our object's 3D position. Now when we run our game, each instanced object in our multi-mesh will have a unique 3D position. For today's example demo, I've created a vortex-like effect to demonstrate how objects in a multi-mesh can be driven by a shader program. The multi-mesh that I'm using contains the same settings as the tutorial, except that I've increased the number of spheres to 1080, and instead of our previous material, there's a custom vortex shader. In the shader, I've used our friend, the Open Simplex Noise resource, to generate a Perlin noise texture that controls the movement and color of the vortex. See my previous tutorial if you want to learn more about Perlin noise. If you'd like to take a closer look at today's tutorial or this demo project, they can be downloaded from the Dave the Dev GitHub page linked below. And if you're interested in what I'm working on from day to day, follow me on Twitter where I post regular devlog updates. Hope to see you over there. Well that'll do for this tutorial. If you learned something useful and like your games running at 60 frames per second, consider hitting the like button. If you want to continue learning about game dev with us at the Dave the Dev community, subscribe and hit the bell icon. Hope to see you again. Until then, happy devving!